Adam Lane Smith, welcome to the Masculine by Design Mancast. How are you doing this evening? Doing really good, bro. How are you doing? Fantastic, man. Great to have you on here. Uh, we are going to be exploring the keys to a successful marriage is what I'm going to coin this podcast uh, title. And it's going to predominantly come from the content in your book here, Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands. That's awesome. So, uh, I got this book as soon as I can. I wasn't one of the first to order it, but uh, I, I, well, I wasn't among the first few to order it, but I, I did get on the, on the ball pretty quickly. And uh, as soon as I got it, started pouring over it and uh, was elated that I got a nice mention in the acknowledgement section. Yes. Uh, so thank you for that, man. I appreciate it. Of course. Uh, but, but the book is an excellent read. Tons of great, great information for guys who um, are struggling in marriage and maybe are trying to understand why I put the pieces together, uh, try to understand how to get that flame back, get that interest back that they want shared with their wife. And uh, your, your book does a masterful job of exploring the psycholog psychological dynamics at play there. And so we're going to dig into that. I, I know we, we had a conversation on the Family Alpha podcast not that long ago. Uh, that is the most listened to, most downloaded podcast on the Family Alpha podcast. So uh, definitely something that a lot of guys are interested in. And so this sequel to that discussion should be something a lot of guys get value from. Uh, so Adam, I want to start off by asking you the question, you know, I, I, actually, I'll let you give a little background and I'm sure you want to give a necessary disclaimer uh, before we get into this, as far as kind of your experience in dealing with uh, problematic marriages and helping to get those marriages back on the right track. Nice. You got me covered in my back, bro. Thank you. Um, I am Adam Lane Smith. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, as it says on my book. Um, everything that I say here, nothing should be taken as healthcare advice. Um, you should not diagnose yourself with anything off this. If you feel that you have some issue after you listening to this podcast, maybe we give you trauma from our senses of humor. Um, you should seek professional help. Don't just diagnose yourself and treat yourself through me or my book or anything like that. If you have any trouble finding a therapist, contact me, go on psychology today and look up one. It's all there. Um, I wrote this book cause I've been doing marriage therapy for quite a while. I've been married myself for quite a while. <laughs> been around a lot of married people my whole life as most of us well most of us have um if i had to sum up the book i would probably say it is good for every single couple it's good for every man even if he's single every man who is ever going to think about engaging in a relationship with anyone people who are now single but have been in long-term relationships may benefit from it quite a bit as they identify the past problems either in partners or in themselves and it's good for people who may have some lingering attachment issues from childhood. Either they were traumatized, their parents were drunks, they went to a lot of daycare and never really connected to anyone, whatever the case might be. If you struggle to be open and vulnerable with a partner and really engage in a marriage and tell your, par your partner what you want with the expectation that they want to meet you halfway, if you struggle with those things, this book is probably for you. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Now, a lot of guys online, they're pushing messages and trying to help guys through situations that they themselves have had to navigate. So is this, is this book a result of things that you've experienced in your own marriage or, or have, you, have you pretty much done a good job of, of hmm. maintaining a strong marriage and more learning from, from the struggles of others? No, my marriage was definitely pretty rocky at the beginning. Um, I struggled with attachment pieces myself. Uh, big eye-opening revelation for me was uh, Dr. Robert Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy. That was a big piece for me, was reading that and kind of hammering home that I had some nice guy tendencies. I definitely had some attachment pieces. I've had been treated for PTSD as well for myself. It's not great. Uh, my marriage has never been perfect. As Through the years, I have worked at it as I was becoming a marriage and family therapist. I've slowly pieced together a good, healthy marriage. I would say now, my wife and I just celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary last month. I'd say our marriage now is better than it has ever been, ever. And I think it's only going to continue to get better, even during difficult, very difficult times. It's been pretty rocky, family-wise, the whole system in the last couple of months, but it's actually brought us closer. We've survived some pretty rocky things because of some of the techniques that I put forth in this book. I think that the people in this, the people that read this book, hopefully will pick up that I'm not just talking out of my butt here. These are things I've lived through and I'm giving practical solutions to people who need them. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that background, Adam. Cause I think it gives a lot more validity to your message and I, regardless of whether you put this to practice in your own life or not, which I assumed you did, 
Um, it, it, there's a ton of great information here that we're going to go through that's in your book. Uh, but to be a man who's lived through it, who's had to go through that struggle and really apply these principles just helps you to understand the struggles that men and women are going through in their marriages today uh, that much better. Now, one of the concepts you talk about, we talked about this in the uh, podcast we did previously, is the concept of vulnerability. And you'll see a lot of guys on Twitter, at least in the sphere that, I'm, that I inhabit, you know, talking about stoicism and never show your emotions, don't wear your heart on your sleeve, uh, never appear vulnerable in front of a woman. And uh, you, know, you give a little bit different take in your book, uh, even going so far as to say that a lack of vulnerability from a husband wreaks a lot of havoc in a marriage. Can you explain a little bit about that dynamic and why you feel so strongly that husbands should be more vulnerable with their wives than many of them are? Absolutely. Uh, I get a lot of blowback from guys in various masculinity pieces, uh, as you and I travel through, who when I say men should be vulnerable to their wives, they choke, they spit, they vomit, they get mad, they say that I'm trying to tell men to just start crying in front of their wife all the time. Uh, and obviously, that's what I want. I, I really want people to be crying all the time. That's, no. Um, <laughs> how do I want to say? Stoicism is extremely important. And you shouldn't be sitting there crying all the time, drenching yourself in feelings and overwhelmed by your feelings. But stoicism does not teach you to shut out all feeling and become an unfeeling robot. Stoicism teaches you to seek out the feelings that you are having, identify them and be aware of them so that you can deal with them and get through them without them governing you. If you simply shut out your feelings, they will consume you. If you shut out your needs, your brain will find a way to get those needs met that you aren't going to like. So when I talk about vulnerability, I'm talking about needs. I'm talking about acknowledging deep down inside of you, I need to feel loved. I need some warmth. I need some comfort. I need some kindness. I'm sad. I'm upset. Um, I just need, I don't know. I need a kiss. I need a hug. I need someone to just sit with me and talk. I just need, I just need to sit here and feel like my wife cares about me for 10 minutes instead of us watching TV. Can we just sit and talk like two adults? So I don't feel so alone. This would be vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability would be acknowledging your sexual needs and not in a, oh, yeah, I need it eight times a day. Like, you know, not like that, but like, okay, here's my actual needs. This is what I need. Vulnerability is simply opening up and expressing your imperfections as an imperfect being who needs things and then asking your partner to help you meet those needs. That's the, that's the vulnerability that I'm trying to teach here. Any man who has a problem with that should not get married because women their, their emotional intimacy and connection to a man grows stronger when we reveal those things. That's how a woman becomes sexually aroused, especially over the long term when she's in a marriage. She becomes sexually aroused through that intimacy, that intimate bond that she creates with a man when he opens up and shares vulnerability. When he does not share vulnerability and share those needs, he is signaling to her that he views her as not worthy of those things and he's not going to be putting down long-term roots. So yeah, maybe in the short term, when you pick up a girl from the bar, she thinks, oh, he's so mysterious. But long term, your wife is going to want you to settle down. And when you're signaling to her that you're not going to settle down, that you don't consider her worthy of that, kiss the marriage goodbye. Yeah, I like that. I like the way you describe stoicism too. The way I always kind of think about that, it's, it's not the absence of feeling. It's more learning how to control your reactions to those feelings. So you, you're not just you're not just blowing up at every little you know, storm that comes in life. You actually are internalizing it, Correct. pondering it, understanding the right way to channel that in a productive way instead of a Correct. destructive way. And you manage those feelings by addressing them proactively and preemptively. You identify the needs that you have and you make sure they don't get away from you. Yeah, exactly right. Now, when you talk about vulnerability, you, you did kind of span a spectrum there, you know, about the, the guy who communicates his needs versus the guy that whines and complains. And I, I'd love to hear some, I guess, some more maybe tangible examples. I know you give several in your book about what healthy vulnerability looks like versus a guy who comes home and just dumps his emotional baggage on his wife day after day. And, you know, cause, cause I think a lot of guys get that visual visual in their head that yeah. when I'm vulnerable, that means I'm just, you know, emotionally dumping on my wife all the time. And I, I don't think that's, that's what you're getting at here. No, not even a little bit. And you're correct. A lot of men will take that view because that's all they can think of. A lot of us, we men, we think in 
binary views. Either I am a man who does not share those feelings and complain, or I am a woman who shares feelings and complains. And there's a wide spectrum for both categories in there. Um, men who are vulnerable, what that tends to look like is when you, when you identify that there's a need, you identify you have some sort of um, craving, um, some, something that you require from your partner or something that you yourself are not quite able to fully handle, you have a partner there, a helpmate if you like, who will assist you in fulfilling that need. Um, you may send them a text and say, hey, just a heads up, I'm having a really rough day here at work today. Do you think that you can get dinner ready for me so I can eat a hot meal right when I get home? I don't want to have to wait. You send a text to them and say, hey, you know what? I really, I need some time to cool off because it's been a bad day. I'm just not going to come home for those two hours. Please take care of things. If, you, if, if that's a problem, let me know. I'll make it up to you later. But this is what I need right now. It's still assertive. It's still not turning control over to your wife. It's telling her what it is you need and presenting that to her at the time that you need it. It's not just dumping your feelings. Oh, I was, oh, I was feeling this. Now I'm crying. No, it's saying this is a need that I have. This is a task that needs to be fulfilled. Please help me with this. This is like a, let me think. This is like a commanding officer who's given marching orders and then goes out and hands them off to the squad. Uh, the squad leaders. This is, ident this is identifying the needs that are coming in and then handing them off to the appropriate department to get those needs met. That's more of what this is about. This is an, this, you don't have the commanding officer come in and then sit down with all the squad leaders and, and talk about his feelings and how he's thinking about changing his hairstyle. And it's, <laughs> this, this is about identifying needs and getting the mission on track. Yeah, so it's a, a controlled, measured, strategic response to a situation and, and not, again, kind of overblowing something and just spewing it out without any thought or, or premonition as, as to what you want to achieve, right? Correct, correct. And the reason I call it vulnerability instead of just, I don't know, direction or asking, the reason it's called vulnerability is because these are innate imperfections in you. Not imperfections like there's something wrong with you, but you're not a perfect being who exists in a total vacuum where you fulfill your own needs. You're an imperfect being who has needs, but can't fulfill them and you need the assistance of others to fulfill them. So you're expressing to your wife, I need this. I am upset today and I need this from you. I, I need some time alone. I need some sex. I, I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling this and this and this. This is what I need. So you share how you're feeling and then you share the exact actionable need that you want from her. You're not just dumping feelings and saying, oh, I feel this. You're saying, this is what I need specifically. Please do this. Yeah, very well said. Now, when we talk about men struggling with vulnerability today, you talk a lot in your book about this concept of detachment, which you know, you're detached from your wife emotionally. You're not going to be able to be vulnerable and vice versa. If she's detached from you, she's not going to be vulnerable with you as well, including sexually, which a lot of guys, you know, that, that that is one of the consequences, right? That a lot of guys are struggling with and usually one of the big things that opens their eyes to the fact that, hey, something's wrong here. That, that is a very real need for men and it's not getting met. They notice very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and when you talk about this concept of detachment, um, I, I, I have this, this experience in my own personal life that it just seems that marriage, before marriage, men and women, maybe it's just that kind of new relationship excitement going on. And maybe it's kind of a false vulnerability that they're displaying to each other. But I, I do see a lot more vulnerability. And then marriage comes, kids come. And it seems that that's when that detachment really starts to take hold, or at least the symptoms of it. Uh, why, why is that? Because, you know, kind of what you said, it's a new relationship, and it's exciting, but you're also trying to hook the other person, but you're not fully invested yet. It's not the deep deep connection. It's not the long march of 50 years for the rest of your life and you're stuck here with this person. It, you still have a way out. When you have an exit plan and a way to escape, it's easier to give those vulnerabilities out because if something goes wrong, you can just bail. But when you're married, you are deeply connected to this other person, but you're also, you love them. You really love this person that would break your heart for them to leave you. So we start locking down and not sharing our imperfections out of fear that they will abandon us essentially for being, or being resentful against us for asking those things of them. That's why it gets worse when we get married and especially when we have kids, then it gets even worse. That's very interesting. So it's almost like a risk mitigation tactic that we subconsciously play. Correct. Uh, to not, not get burned. 
Correct. Now, now how does, so you talk in your book about this, and I think it's a very important point that I'm sure you can go into a lot of detail here, but how does the way that uh, predominantly men, but also women, uh, how does the way that they're being brought up today, how they're being raised uh, either in the home or, or by uh, institutions in society, how is that playing into this whole uh, epidemic of detachment issues in marriage? Boy. Um, well, I'm going to give you a very brief history lesson for about 60 seconds. So back in this country, back in the 30s, we had something called the Great Depression. You may have heard of it. Uh, during this time, you get something called, well, the silent generation is around this time. The greatest generation is around this time. The greatest, the silent, and then the boomers, um, I believe is the order it went in. Um, but basically, they had to buckle down and survive. Parents had to work like 14-hour shifts, seven days a week. They almost never saw their kids. Moms were being pulled out of the home at this time to start working for the war effort or running little home businesses to try to make cash. Kids are not getting just constant, oh, I love you. They're not getting this because the parents are exhausted. The parents are saving every little rusty bolt and nail that they possibly could because they may have to build a house out in the woods with their bare hands kind of thing and their house is taken away and repossessed parents didn't have time to give love and affection to the kids so connections during this time are massively disrupted if you look at there's a play called the glass menagerie um, about a father a family that's left when the father just walks out and abandons them and the destruction that happens to this small family in this tiny poverty stricken apartment um it, it, this is a horrible time. And out of this is born the silent generation, I believe is next, who go out and just work and work and work. The boomers are born after that to parents who can't connect with them, are struggling, are try, in, many way, tra in many ways traumatized. They're surviving rather than living and they're clinging to life with their fingernails, trying to provide a life for their kids. All they can give them is scraps of money and, and old used things that they've saved. The boomers, a lot of them, were devastated by this and were unable to connect, but didn't know why. This is why you see a lot of those boomers say, well then screw everyone else. It's all about me. I got to feel good. And they turn into this me, me, me generation. Um, right now they're tripling the divorce rates in the 70 to 80 category range because they're getting divorced in that category. Boomers are still getting divorced in their eighties. Who gets divorced? Like just, just buckle in and one of you will die eventually. But um, Probably mo most of them are likely second, third, or fourth divorces as well. Or so. seventh. I got, a great, I got a great uncle who's on his seventh marriage, and his wife is on her seventh marriage. Uh, <laughs> and, and they were married. I think they were each other's like third marriage, and they, they split off, <laughs> married other people, and then got back together. Um, out of the boomers comes the rest of us. You're my generation, and then the people below us. And it's getting worse and worse with each generation because we're focusing more on us and our families are being ripped apart. And we're being told things like, sometimes love just doesn't work out. Sometimes marriages just don't work. Families just don't stay together. It's fine. Don't worry about it. The two family household is dumping us into daycare over and over and over. So we have every day we got a different worker and we're trying to fight for approval and love from people. And then when mom gets home from work, she's exhausted and doesn't have time to look at us doesn't want to talk to us. Um, kids are in five different sports and they're eating granola bars in the car. And that's the extent of family time they have for an entire week. Things like this are leading to these ma this massive e epidemic of people that cannot attach securely to other people. People who do not believe that they will be loved for themselves. They believe that they must go out and earn love from other people. People who believe that the reason their parents didn't pay attention to them, didn't love them, abandoned them, tormented them, um, abused them, neglected them, whatever it might be, the reason their parents did that is because there's something horrible deep down inside of that person and everyone else can see it, but they don't know what it is. So they can't open up and share what that is. They can't tell people what that is because people will see that and abandon them. So they got to lock down. Can't let anyone ever see who I am inside ever because there's this horrible thing and I don't know what it is, so it could come out on accident. That's the epidemic that we're looking at right now. That was, that's what gives rise to um, Tinder. <laughs> people going out and banging as many people as they can without even knowing their first name. Uh, false intimacy so they can feel like they are close to someone for a moment, even if they get five STDs from it. Uh, all kinds of things through the manosphere. Men just banging their way through piles of women. But the moment she says, you know, I think I kind of love you. He like bails out and pulls the parachute cord. And then they, they go out and some guys go out and teach this to other guys and say, this is healthy. You should be doing this all the time. 
women are doing this too. Men and women are both doing this. This is our culture right now. It's growing. It's not getting better. It's getting worse as the generations go on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that. Uh, you know, we look at society right now and I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but something around, around 40% of homes, there's, there's not a father present or the biological father's not present. And like in the black community, it's something like 65, 70%. And so many kids are growing up in broken homes to, from divorced households. And you, you actually covered a question that I was going to ask as you were talking, you know, because we see a lot of these uh, kind of pendulum swings, right? You know, a generation grows up hyper conservative and the next one's kind of more liberal and then it swings back the other way. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to detachment issues, I, I was going to ask you that, you know, these, these kids that are growing up in these homes and they're, they're growing up in these, in these homes where vulnerability is something that isn't present. They, they really aren't getting nurtured to the level that they should be. Maybe they get the feminine nurturing, but they don't get the masculine or vice versa. And when they grow up, you know, I, I was curious how that affects them. But on the one hand, I, I was thinking it might be possible that that might open them up to being more prone to attachment because it's something that they didn't experience. But I think what you explained is, is probably a lot more accurate is that they are prone to that attachment, but they don't know what a healthy attachment looks like. So they seek it in false substitutes. There you go. At least the anxious attachments, which are desperate and obsessive and clinging to anything, even if they're being abused. This is a lot of the girls that hang around those guys who say, yeah, just who cares? She's just something, you know, who cares what she's feeling? These are those girls that are jumping into bed with guys on the first date desperately trying to earn his love so he'll stay with her these are the girls on tinder going on tinder said please 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 this 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 is these girls trying to find love and they don't know how to do it um sad desperate state of affairs that we're in right now with that yeah so how do how do the guys like the the migtows how do they fit into this i mean they're pretty much withdrawing right they're saying i i don't need a woman i'm i'm doing my own thing i mean uh, they just gone off the cynical cliff or I mean, what's, <laughs> what's going you know, on? Um, I wish I could say that they were just going off a cynical cliff. I got a really good buddy. That's a big toe. It's definitely not for me. And I don't, I don't really think that's the way to do it, but I honestly can say that uh, some men are smart to do it that way because it's, it's, it's not a random game of chance when you connect to a woman, but if you don't know how to find all those red flags. And if you were living in a society where even the slightest mistake could lead to shattering your life and destroying your children, grandchildren and great grandchildren for generations with attachment problems, I could definitely see where they're coming from. Um, Again, it's that whole, the risk aversion, right? I mean, that is the ultimate risk mitigation. I mean, it is, it is what it is completely. Right. I don't, I don't know that I would say every MGTO guy has an attachment problem. I think that they, they probably are surround, have been surrounded by women who have attachment problems, and they probably have viewed that, that that's, that's probably their standard model for femininity is to have attachment issues at that point, and they, they don't want any part of that. <laughs> they just don't. I can't blame them. If, if that's really all they think that is out there, I can't blame them one bit for running the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. One, and one thing I'm thinking, too, is we're talking about this concept of vulnerability, and, and I don't think... I've really made this connection in my mind until we're just talking right now, but I think it's a valid one is that when we talk about men taking ownership in the family, asserting themselves, leading, setting the direction and the tone for, for their wives and their children, that in and of itself is a vulnerability, right? I mean, you are, you're investing yourself in that. That is you saying, get on my back. This is the direction we're going. Trust me to lead you, right? That, that, is, that is a vulnerability and an ultimate turn on for women. And I, I never really made that, that connection that, that vulnerability is at work there. Yes, it is. Yeah. The gears are turning, man. <laughs> uh, so, so for guys who are listening, the husband who's listening and he's in a marriage and he's thinking he might be suffering from detachment issues or his marriage might be suffering from detachment issues. Um, you know, obviously we talked earlier about dead bedroom is one of the easy ways to tell that, 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 that vulnerability between the couple is, is missing. And uh, there's something that, that needs to be corrected. But what are some other symptoms? What are some ways that guys can kind of uh, take assessment of their marriage and know if detachment issues are the problem versus something else that might be at play? Yeah, totally. Um, I do a deep dive on this in my book. But some basic pieces is if, if you or your wife, either one of you or both of you could have attachment issues, 
if you guys are not communicating about what you really want, if you're expecting the other person to figure it out and then they don't and you're hurt and upset and feel like they just don't care about you enough to read your mind and give you what you wanted. Like they should just know if your wife is telling you, you should just know what I want. That's a real clear sign that she might have attachment problems. If your wife is not able to calmly express her feelings to you and say, this is what I'm having, this is what's going on, and this is what I would like from you. If she's ah, screaming and, and screeching at you about what she's demanding and you've, it's, and it's things you've never really heard before. If your wife can only be honest with you when she hits major load and is screaming at you and finally telling you she's been angry and resentful at you for six months. If you do that to your wife, if you have periodic blow-ups once a month where you finally boil over and share all the things she's done wrong, if she does that to you, um, if you are constantly seeking approval from your wife, if you are withholding feelings to get her approval or you're afraid of what she'll think of you, if you share a need, um, if you can't ask your wife for sex, point blank, if you can't look at your wife and say, I need to have sex tonight, how's this going to happen? If you can't look at your wife and ask for specific things during the sexual activity, if you're like, oh, no, I, I couldn't ask my wife that. If you, and it's normal stuff that you guys do anyway, but you're trying to you, – you, you, you do t 10 nice things for her hoping she'll offer that thing because you can't bring yourself to ask. If those are your problems, you may have attachment issues. Yeah, that, that is a, an interesting thing that so many guys do. And it's like, you know, we, we talk about in, you know, the manosphere, guys are swapping notes, but somehow – Guys outside, don't put that together. That You can't do more chores. You can't just do things around the house and expect that to elicit your wife's sexual desire. She might be thankful, right? She might appreciate it. But that's yeah. a lot different than making her tingle, right? There's, that's not yeah. the same response. Yeah, no woman has ever, ever had sex with her husband because he vacuumed the living room. That's, that's just not how it happens. <laughs> now, they may, they may take that as a symbol of something deeper that's happening, but that deeper thing has to be happening. Yeah. Now I'm a huge proponent as, as I know you are as well of guys owning their business and taking personal responsibility, leading the home and, and again, taking ownership over what that means for the man. And I think when, when guys who aren't doing that start to do that, it fixes a lot of problems. Yes. And I want to, I want, I do want to talk about that, but I also want to, want to address, you know, th there's two, two people at play here, right? There's a husband and a wife. And so for the guy who, he recognizes his need to lead, his need to, to be more vulnerable, change his life around, and, and particularly in that relationship. Uh, what does he do in order to kind of help the wife kind of fix her issues, if you will, or, or can he? I mean, is that, is that more for her to work through, or, or is there something that he can do to kind of make sure that he's not just changing, but he can kind of steer both of them in the direction that they need to go? You know, you're 100% right. We, um, in the manosphere, there are a lot of men who forget that their wife is a functioning human being who can think. Uh, a lot of times we're almost encouraged to view our wife as a vagina with instincts, and that's the extent of her participation in our life. But if you're yeah. married, your wife is your partner. She is your helpmate. She's there to help you. If you are in command, fantastic. But you have a second in command who's right there. You have a first mate on your ship. You have a squad leader, whatever you want to call it. She is the person you give the orders. She implements them. Um, your kids would be the sailors on your ship or whatever. If you want to go with this metaphor. Um, but your wife is your first mate. You give orders. She implements them. She makes sure things are happening. She reports to you when there are problems. This is her role. And women are most content in this role when they take that second position. So they don't have to take all the blame if something goes wrong. Misogyny, Adam. This is yeah, misogyny. I know. I know, right? I'm a horrible, evil <laughs> person. But they can have input in the process. They need to have input in the process, but they don't want to make the final decision. This is where the majority of women, I should say, the majority of women are happiest and most satisfied and content is in this middle position right here. If you are skipping over your wife and disregarding her and treating her as a child in the home, your marriage will not last very long. This is why you see a lot of guys in the manosphere on their fifth marriage and their ex-wives are not necessarily the horrible harpies that they claim they are. This is part of the reason for that. So how do you help your wife with her issues? Uh, my book. <laughs> you just make her read my book. No. Um, you need a shared language. 
Um, reading my book is a fantastic way to do that. Reading No More Mr. Nice Guy is a fantastic way to do that. Sharing the information so that you both have a shared language with shared understanding of what attachment is, of what, like what you and I are doing here, what vulnerability is about the expectations in the marriage. Sharing those expectations, that is how you begin to fix that. Simply sharing those and opening up, you create this open intimacy between the two of you, which tests those the assumptions in the back of your brain that you've had all this time about no one will ever love me. No one wants to know what my problems are. If I open up and share them, people will abandon me. My wife will resent me. She'll hate me. I'll be living under a bridge with coyotes because no one will want me near them. Um, by opening up and sharing that and testing that with your partner, you challenge those assumptions in the back and your brain starts to remap. Cognitive remapping takes place and your brain says, okay, maybe it's not always a bad thing to be vulnerable and loving. The same thing happens with your wife. As you lead her and show her this openness and then acknowledge it and say, isn't it great that we're being more open? We really should continue to do this. She'll, oh yeah, you're right. It is good. And sure, she'll prioritize it. And if you want something to change in your life, tell your wife that you plan to make it change because she'll remember it forever. And if you fail to make that happen, she'll catch you on it immediately. <laughs> yes. And remember that forever as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's their role. That's their role. That's what, a, that's what a first mate does. A first mate keeps a perfect log of everything. So when the captain says, have I ever messed up before? The first mate can say, yes, and bring out the chart of every mistake the captain's ever made so that the captains can say, okay, why did I make that mistake? And how do I make sure it doesn't happen again? That's the role. A lot of men shiver and collapse and get angry and resentful at their wife for being their wife. This is what women do. You don't, you don't hate a shark for being a predator. You don't hate a bird for flying. You don't hate your wife for having a really good memory about how you have messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we talk about women not being automatons, they have free will, right? They're going to react to the things that we do, or maybe they won't. Maybe they will resist. Uh, are, are there, in your experience, Adam, are there uh, situations where no matter what a guy does to kind of take ownership and fix his side of things that a woman just might say, sorry, I've had enough. I, I, I'm not willing to engage anymore or invest in this. I mean, it, or, or do you typically see women responding positively uh, when a man starts to take ownership over that masculine role in the home? The vast majority of the time it is extremely wonderful and a woman will like just be overwhelmed with how happy she is that he's taking that ownership. There are two times that I see that fail, two times, and they're both ex specific extreme examples. One is when it has just been too horrendous for like 15, 20 years, and she is really, really checked out, and she's, she's not even going to give you a chance. It, it, even then, sometimes it can happen, but it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of patience and a lot of humility and most men don't have that in them at that point they just want everything to be fixed and great so they rush the job and that wife is just she can't handle it anymore um that's an extreme example most wives even when they're exhausted the title of my book even when they're exhausted they are able to summon up some energy after a couple of weeks of a man really showing her a difference a consistent difference consistency being the, the primary piece there um, the other extreme is when that woman has something like a personality disorder where she is just overwhelmingly messed up, where she is manipulative, where she is just, for lack of a better word, insane. Um, I have multiple times I have had I'm working with a man in single therapy and his wife and I'm, I'm telling him and guiding him through some of these things and his wife gives me a phone call to inform me about all the things that are wrong with him and how he's secretly like this evil human being and she's the put upon one and he's the, and it's like, I don't even know, I don't even know this person. I have no relation with this person whatsoever, but she's calling me to just, just to make sure I know that she's the put upon one. I've had this happen many times. Um, or she comes into session and just boils over and makes it all about how unhappy she is and how she's the saint. Um, she blows up the moment he tries to make anything right and it scares the crap out of her because now it's unstable. She doesn't have total control anymore. Personality disorders, extreme examples. Rare that I see that, but I have seen it a number of times. Um, 
those two times are the only times I've ever seen a wife not respond positively to her husband taking some ownership of his actions. I don't care how extreme liberal feminist a woman is when she comes in my office. If her husband changes and becomes more assertive, she loves it. And she tells me that. And often they are confused. The feminists are confused about why they're so happy, but they don't want to stop it because they're so happy. Yeah. Now, what about uh, you know marriages that have a uh, history of infidelity and that kind of thing. Does that, does that play a factor or do, do marriages tend to get over that? I work with that so often. Two thirds of all marriages have an affair is the estimation right now. Um, I work with couples who come in and they just had an affair two weeks ago. I start fixing things with them real quick. And within a couple of weeks, they both report that the marriage is better than it's ever been. And they just had an affair at that point a month or two ago. Um, the wife just, she doesn't forget but she is so incredibly happy that this was a catalyst that broke free and the husband is now acting consistently, again, consistently in the role that she wants him in, that she's just happy. Um, and remember that physical intimacy, physical affairs, sexual affairs for men are the worst type of affair. Emotional affairs, they bother us, but yeah, we can get over them. Um, sexual affairs, not so much. And we're programmed biologically to be that way because we don't want to raise someone else's kid. For women, it's the opposite. You go out and you screw some, some woman in the street, um, your wife's going to be angry. But if you go out and you find some woman, you start sharing your emotions and being vulnerable with her, your wife is going to go nuclear. Um, there's a reason for that. Your wife can forgive you for physical affairs, but emotional affairs mean that you're going to be yanked away from the family and abandon her and the children. Now, now, just to be clear, I don't believe Adam is giving any guys listening to this encouragement to go off and, and cheat on the wives. Oh, no, no, idea, no, no, right? no, no. I'll, I'll find you and I'll beat you with a baseball bat. But, but uh, no, 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 no. Don't go that way. It is recoverable if, if you do. Absolutely. <laughs> if, that happens if, if you have, it happens. Um, it's unfortunate, but it happens. And with this system that I have in place, I mean, you're going to have to admit it to your wife. You can't just go on and pretend it never happened. But it doesn't have to be the end of a marriage. It can actually be a catalyst that makes the marriage better. Yeah. Now I want to go back to something you talked about earlier. Uh, so I actually got a couple of questions from guys who listened to our last podcast about telling your wife, your sexual needs, telling her how often you want to have sex. And uh, a couple of questions that I got were one, what are some strategic ways to go about that? You know, and do, do you just, you know, whip it out and say, Hey honey, it's, it's time to go. Or I mean, it, <laughs> One of those things that you kind of build up to it and, and lay hints or, you know, just very direct and assertive. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I've not been in this, you know, I, I, I struggled with it because I, I've, fortunately, I've, I've had other than a few little, you know, short spells of, you know, times with my wife and I just weren't connecting very well. It uh -huh. weren't very long lasting. I, I have a, I've had a pretty sexually health, healthy marriage. Um, so I wasn't really sure uh, how to go about, you know, explaining that to them. And then the other question I had was, or that I was getting was, how do you deal with rejection, right? So once you do make yourself vulnerable and you say, hey, here, here are my needs, and she says, sorry, but no, you know, uh, how do you respond to that? Good question. Um, keep that second one because we'll come back to it. Um, how do you ask your wife for your sexual needs? So what I usually tell guys is I say schedule it. Sch tell her how often you need it, and then you work around that. The worst thing you can do is your wife is in bed doing paperwork, and you rush in and you drop your pants and you're whipping it around back and forth. Um, and you're saying, all right, let's do this. And then you leap on top of her like a leopard on a gazelle. Worst thing you could really do. Maybe your wife might be into it at times if you've built the relationship and been gaming her all day. But the vast majority of women will not go in for that. Um, yeah, you will be rejected at that point, most likely. However, um, the best thing I tell people is don't tell your wife – I need to have sex right now. Tell your wife, give her a warning, give her notice. You know what? I'm, I'm looking for something. It, it needs to happen here today or tomorrow. What can we do? It'd be great if we could do it today. What can you give me today? Um, send your wife fun text. Make it fun. Make it fun. I've, um, in my own marriage, I wrote up a fake, I was trying to make my wife laugh. I wrote up a fake, like, fill in the blanks, like legal form of like, your spouse is contacting you for blood. And, and she laughed and laughed, but it was, it was great. Um, there's fun little things you can do to ask your wife, make it part of the flirting, make it part of the gaming, have fun with it. 
you're asking your partner to have sex with you. You're not asking her to drive a nail through her own hand. It's fun for both. It should be fun for both of you. I would hope if it's not, you gotta talk about that and fix that. Um, well, I think that's part of the problem is that the, the, the guy fears that rejection that he's faced so much in the marriage that he can't bring himself to have fun and be comfortable because he's so worried about you know, what yeah. if she says no, right? Oh, yeah. And your it's wife. Like the same thing when you're single. If you go, if you approach a woman, so this woman who you have no affiliation with, no relationship with, and you're so scared if she says no, and what happens if she says no? You're in the same position you're in before. Right. Same thing here. Part of it's no, you already weren't getting sex. So, I mean. Part of it's pitching it as a need, though. You tell your wife, I really need this. You don't just say, hey, it'd be great. You say, hey, you know what? I'm stressed. It's been a couple of days. I'm feeling it building up. I need. We need to have sex soon. Um, if your wife says no to that, you got deeper problems than sex. Um, but if you're telling your wife, this is my need, the expectation as a married couple is that she will work with you to meet your needs, and you're going to work with her to meet her needs. That's marriage. If you guys are refusing to meet each other's needs, there's a much deeper problem than the sex. Uh, a healthy marriage, a healthy marriage, you should be able to tell your wife, you know what, I'm really needing it. I'm feeling the itch. We got to make this happen. She shouldn't say no. What she should say is something along the lines of, I really can't tonight. I'm exhausted. I got a headache. My leg is broken. Can't you see the cast? Whatever it might be. Um, she should be able to give you a reasonable answer. But if she's saying, no, I don't really want to tonight, well, you say, okay, well, what can we do to fix that? Because I have this need right now. And if she's, nah, I don't want to, I just, that's, that's a whole, again, that's a whole separate problem. And you got to fix that first. That's not about the sex. Um, for women, if there's intimacy there, they almost never say no. If you have the intimate, vulnerable connection there, and they're probably not going to tell you no, unless she has a real reason. Wives, one of the one of the worst things that, that they feel is when they tell their husband no. People, men are surprised how often I have wives come into my office and they feel so incredibly guilty for not having sex with their husband. When they ask, when I ask them how long it's been since they had sex, they get really guilty and they go home and have sex immediately with their husband because they feel so bad. Then the next time they come back and they make sure I know that they had sex with their husband because they're a bad wife for not. That's in their mind. Um, wives feel awful when they say no to their husband, as long as she feels connected to her husband. So she's probably not going to tell you no. If you're fearing rejection, how do I want to say this? If you're fearing rejection, then you are doing something that I call investing in outcomes rather than investing in the person. You are not investing in your relationship with your wife. You should be going to her and saying, I want to connect with you. I want to have sex with you. If your wife is saying no, there's a reason there and you need to figure out what that reason is. If it's because you've gained 47 pounds in the last week from eating ice cream nonstop and now she's not attracted to you, then that's something you need to manage. If it's because she's upset, if it's but whatever it might be, if she's telling you no, you need to identify the reason why. And don't whine. Please don't whine and say, why? Why not? Say, okay, well, what would, what would have to change for you to want to do it? What would have to change for us to feel closer? Are you not feeling connected to me? Is that what's going on? Um, don't, by all means. So many husbands fall back on, but then, what, what, are you cheating on me? So many husbands fall back on that. Wives can just, they can just click it off, or they just don't feel it. We husbands, we can't really do that. So our assumption if she, is if she's not having sex with us, she's having sex with someone else, uh, and he's hiding outside the window in the bushes right now. It's just not that way. If you're fearing rejection, you're investing in having sex with your wife as validation. If your wife says no to you, it does not mark who you are as a person or your value as a person. And you're again, you're probably going back to that the attachment and detachment piece. If you if your wife saying no crushes you, that's a problem. If your wife says no, you should say, What would make her say this? Well, let's talk about it. Let's don't just assume. Um have I beat this to death yet? Yeah, no, you did good. And one, one outlet that I that I I know a lot of guys go to. I know you do. You, I'm sure, see this as well as porn. You know, guys are not getting the sex they want in their marriage, and so they turn to porn to get that release. Uh, how does that How does that play into this whole uh, struggle in marriage? I mean, yeah, what does that do to exacerbate the problem, or does it? Using porn is the same. I tell people using porn is much the same as smoking marijuana. The biggest problem is that you're not doing what you should be doing with that time. With marijuana, when people have anxiety and they smoke pot, 
Um, they are giving up the chance to learn new coping skills that will actually fulfill them and make their life better. Instead, they're just doing an immediate fix that makes them feel better in the moment. They stop using any other skills so that the ones they do have get rusty and dis excuse me, get rusty and disappear, and they don't learn any new ones. So they get frozen at this point in time. Porn, same thing. You, it's an opportunity to be physically intimate with your wife that you are simply throwing in the garbage. You're simply throwing it down the drain, flushing it down the sewer at this chance to be connected with your wife. Um, and there's plenty of science that shows this porn is bad for you. Um, people are going to argue and say it's great. And you should be doing it all the time. I was just on Amazon looking at a marriage book um, close to mine in rankings. I've surpassed it, thank goodness. But it was a book talking about how porn is great for marriage and couples should be looking at porn together. Um, research shows that men who use porn uh, when they are later shown a picture of an attractive woman, the part of the brain responsible for tool use lights up instead of the part of the brain responsible for human interaction. Whereas if you are not using porn, the part of your brain that lights up for human interaction acts up. Um, porn also teaches men to focus on body parts instead of on the woman and the full experience. So guys who use porn are frequently focused on their, instead of, like looking at her and, and having sex with her, he's staring at her boobs, then he stares at another piece and he stares at another piece, almost like he's panning the camera around, trying to get as much uh, enjoyment and stimulation out of each of those body parts as he can. And he almost forgets she's in the room as he's doing this. Um, porn just diminishes the experience and it robs you of the time you should be spending with your wife. That's all. Yeah. Uh, so Adam, I, I have one last topic I want to want to broach with you here and that's, uh, that's the topic of the guy who's who's single, he's not married yet, and he wants to prevent falling into the circumstances that, that you've been talking about here today. Mm. So uh, for the single guy who isn't married yet, but knows he wants to get married, knows he wants to have children, uh, what are some things that he can do to set himself up for success in marriage? You discussed earlier about you know, guys knowing how to identify red flags. So obviously that plays into it. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of vetting and obviously knowing how to vet is a, is a big deal in terms of, you know, you, you got to get the right partner. I mean, if you, you get, you get a, a woman who has a, a ton of baggage and she has attachment issues, it's just going to make your life a lot harder. So what are, what's some advice you can give to them? Guys look at vetting all wrong. I think that guys in the, in the red pill community, in the manosphere, they look at vetting all wrong as we have to filter out, carefully filter out women who have these damaged qualities. And that's part of it. But the second half of that is you need to create a system that drives those women away so they select themselves out and run screaming from you while attracting the healthy women. That's what my book is designed to teach people to do. Um, by being open and vulnerable and simple and connected with people about your needs, by being blunt, this is what I need from you, this is what I expect, meet this or don't. Uh, by sharing those needs openly and connecting and, and building that communication back and forth and being that blunt with it. What I tell people is on your very first date that you have with anyone, you should be laying out what you expect in a relationship, what you will not tolerate in a relationship, what your life vision is, how many kids you want, if you want to get married, where you want to live, you should be boom, 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 laying those out uh, the, on the first date, in the first 20 minutes, you should be laying this out. And women who have attachment issues, who are just in it for fun, who can't connect to that level, who are scared of you rejecting them, who have abandonment problems that are going to blow up into sexual problems later, those women are going to say, you're a psycho, and they're going to get up and run screaming from the table, and you're going to, then you don't have to pay her dessert. Um, women who are looking for that, women who have good attachments, women who are solid and looking for a family life, women who are looking for what you are looking for are going to say, I'm going to handcuff myself to you and we're getting married tomorrow because I'm not letting you out of my sight. Those women are going to be flocking to you in massive numbers, desperate to connect with you because that's what they want. Scare the hell out of the bad women and they'll run screaming from you, but draw the good ones in like a beacon. And it just, this expands beyond just dating and women. This expands to your relationships with friendships, work relationships, professional relationships, family members, as you, as you push yourself into this and develop healthy attachment styles, as you project those things outward and show people what you expect from them, as you bluntly tell them your needs and expect them to be met, and then tell them when they are not meeting your needs as well, when you share those things, unhealthy people are going to just bail out left and right. But healthy people, 
they can't get enough of you. Yeah. No, a lot of women won't know what to do with that. Actually, you're sitting across from a man who's verbalizing exactly what he will and will not tolerate and what he's looking for. And right. Yeah. To, to hear a man talk to them that way is going to blow their mind. You know, it's like, refreshing and yeah. it's wonderful and they love it. And you can almost hear the eggs drop when you do that. Exactly right. All right, Adam. Well, I don't have much else uh, to go over today, man. Is there anything else you want to leave our listeners with? <sighs> I just think that the biggest problem is that people don't even think there's a different way to live. They hear people like you and me talking about sharing our needs openly and being vulnerable in that way. And they said, yeah. And they say, yeah, right. Yeah. All right, buddy. You have no idea what that's going to be like. Yeah, you have no idea. These women are going to eat me alive and, and you're just going to give me five divorces this way. Or they say, no one could ever love me like that. And I could never do that. I'm too terrified to do that. And to those people, I say, read my book. Um, the biggest battle is just getting you to accept that there's a different way to live. There's a foundational thing that's been shoved into the back of your head since you were little. It's same as your belief in gravity and your belief that you need to breathe oxygen. You also believe these pieces that you have to keep yourself locked away, that you are not lovable. You have to earn love from other people. Um, these are foundational beliefs that you have that need to be challenged. My book goes into depth about how to kind of dig that out, show people what that looks like and how to give them a new perspective. And then tons of skills about how to make that happen. Yeah. I, I would like to add to Adam and you can tack onto this if you'd like, but you know, a lot of guys are being told today that, you know, stay away from marriage. The risk is too great. And I, I take a different view. I, I think that if you apply the concepts that, that you espouse in this book and that you were teaching and that I, for the, I, for the most part, exemplify in my marriage, I am not scared one bit that my marriage will fail. I'm not. I, I've, I've had a great marriage. My wife submits to me. She follows my lead. I take care of my job as the masculine leader of the home. And when guys do that, I'm not going to say that, that uh, the risks become zero, but it, it becomes very small. And it's interesting to me. I see a lot of these guys online who are preaching to predominantly younger men about how women are and how they understand women and the female psychology and how to control and manipulate them. But they're the same ones who tell these men not to get married. And I'm telling you, if you understand how to apply these kinds of techniques and you own, uh, own the ship and you are the captain in that marriage and you assert yourself and you lead, the chances of your marriage uh, failing are very, very much mitigated uh, compared to the averages that you see being you know, perpetuated in our country and throughout the world, really. Correct. Yeah, those, those men make the, make it sound like the divorce rate is 90%. The divorce rate is 50%, but there's a lot of factors that go into that too. There's a lot of factors that bleed that off that you can get you can get it down to damn near zero as long as you pay attention to some of those factors and vet <laughs> both actively and proactively, you know, get them out, get the bad ones out, get the good ones in. Um, all kinds of factors go into that. No, I am not against marriage in any way, shape, or form. I think marriage probably is not for everyone, but I think marriage is for most. I think that women generally want to get married and they want to stay in a marriage. I have seen women endure horrible, horrible marriages to just atrocious men. And the women endure it because they love their husband and they want to make it work. They have, and they also have these guilt things inside of them that make them stay in it. They have insecurities that make them stay in it. As long as you are leading your wife in a healthy way and she started out relatively healthy enough for you to connect, as long as you're being mindful and careful about these things and you understand how female sexuality works and female intimacy works and female communication works, as long as you know those things, you don't have to be terrified that your wife is all of a sudden one day going to burn the house down and shoot you and leave you for dead in the woods. It just doesn't quite go that way. Most marriages that fall apart, and I'm going to say this as a marriage therapist, most marriages that fall apart, the wife gave her husband 10 years worth of rope to hang himself, and he chose to ignore all of the signs. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Adam. I, I wanted to leave you guys at that point because – I know there are going to be a plenty of guys listening to this who the whole time they're listening to this are like, oh, screw marriage. I'm never getting married. And all these guys are telling me not to get married. And here's why I, I don't, I don't need this information. But uh, if you do plan on getting married, you need this information. And like Adam said, you can get that in his, in his new book, Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands, a great read. Uh, Adam, tell our listeners where they can go to get their copy and uh, also connect with you on social media or otherwise. 
Great. Um, I'm on Amazon. You do not want to just type Adam Smith into Amazon because you're going to get this old dead guy who talks about economics. What you want to type is exhausted wives. You're going to find my book. You may find some, I don't know, some porn books too or something because that's a weird title. But if you type exhausted wives in Amazon, it'll be there. If you buy the paperback copy, you can then go back and buy the Kindle copy for free. So you can start reading right, right away uh, and you'll still get the paperback copy coming in. Um, Kindle version is four ninety nine, so it's five bucks for this book. It's not going to waste too much money. It's the price of a burger. Um, now you're raising the, the price book. on it, right? Just to, to, to I just a did sense of urgency in the guys here, you know. Yeah, you I, just I, did. Just, okay. I just raised the price because um, people were telling me that nonfiction shouldn't be priced as low as it was, and I was thinking, well, I'm I've been poor my whole life. I couldn't afford much of a book. I don't want to price it out of people's price range. But apparently, when you price nonfiction too low, people think it's low quality. So I raised the price a little bit, but for, for 10 bucks, you get the paperback and the Kindle copy. That's both copies. Um, where can you find me? I am at the Brometheus on Twitter. I am also at Adam Lane Smith books, I think, or Adam Smith books. It's my Twitter, my author one I almost never use. Um, I have a website, adamlanesmith.com, where I talk about my books, mostly my nonfiction books. <laughs> um, that's what I'm doing, bro. That's me. And he, he's also a member inside of the Fraternity of Excellence to pitch that. So any of you guys there we go. decide to join, you will get some uh, good access to Adam and, and all the brothers inside of there. Now, that was uh, a game changer for me, jumping in that a little over a year ago. That was where things started really happening for me, having guys kick me in the butt and push me forward instead of me just kind of drifting and saying, ah, coulda, woulda, shoulda. I said it after our last podcast. I'm going to say it again. I want to have you back on here because I want to pick your brain about uh, about uh, your life as an author and the, the, the tips and tools and things that you do that make you successful because you crank out content like nobody that I know. I'm sure you in the circles you hang, there are people who outdo you by, by uh, a wide margin, but uh, you are an inspiration for me with the way that you write and the content you produce. And I don't know, how, how, how long did it take you to put this book out? Um, so that book I wrote in about five days. And then I edited it in a couple of days um, and then I just shoved it out. I actually wrote that book over Christmas break and I just published it. So I'd say with my formatting, with proofreading, which took weeks and weeks, um, chopping that out, it, it took me maybe a week to really put that book all together with everything. That I That was incredible, man. I, I saw you announce that you were going to write it and it was like, like, <laughs> that. like, okay, it's done here. You guys proofread it. I'm like, psychology Dang. i do psychology all day long so when it comes to writing it it's nothing i can write 2000 i can write 2500 words a minute when it comes to my opinion in psychology i write about half that when i gotta write non when i gotta write fiction stories so this is this i'd love to have you back on sometime to talk writing uh the skill of writing and how to develop that because uh you are a fantastic writer both fiction and non-fiction and uh Thank yeah you. looking forward to uh, maxwell cane burrito avenger coming out here in the yeah there we go all right, Adam. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you, bro.